the best of could See if I can uh, get to see him. Where is he? You see him? There he is. Got him. Look at that guy. Wow, he is seriously impressively large. One of the bigger bulls I've seen so far. His second turn. It's beautiful spiraling horns. Certainly the most beautiful antelope that uh, we get out here. But uh, certainly a beautiful, beautiful specimen. Looks like he's on his own. Not, uh, it's not uncommon to see bulls like this on, the, on their own. Possibly he was asked. must have been amazing try and go a bit forward All right, looks like he's moved off. We'll head out. Just getting updates from uh, some of the guys where they're going to be heading. Sounds like Johnny wants to go up north. Didn't hear Texan very well. But how about that for a specimen of a kudu? He had won and he had completed that second turn on those horns. That is huge. They only get to about three turns on the horn. It's about as big as they get. But uh, the three turned horns are certainly quite rare. So that is one of the larger ones that are in the area, I'm sure. He needs to be out mating with as many females as possible, spreading those, those beautiful genes so that the males that are born are born with the intent of having horns like that. Stop at the dam and then I'll uh, just uh, get rid of this branch. Ah, oh, there we go. He's gone. Alright, Buffalo's hooked down. See a pied kingfisher hovering. from us. Go be doing its Okay. I'm not yet to harm anything, don't worry. Okay. 
All right. See if you can get that pied kingfisher in the background there. Beautiful pied kingfisher. Okay. Hello, Alan. Alan's asking, with the fires sort of moving through, is it possible that these animals will move away from that fire and uh, onto Western Gauri? And uh, is there the potential to have prolific game? Um, well, it is possible, Alan. It is very, very possible. Um, I don't think it's going to be around every corner, as you suggest, but all the non-territorial animals, animals that live in home ranges that are free to move, um, will certainly avoid the fire and move greater distances. Um, but uh, certainly the territorial species will try to avoid the, the, the head of the fire and then sort of move out the area and then move back in afterwards. So certainly we might get, we might get uh, some herd of elephant um, maybe some buffalo coming through. So, yes, the potential for more game is there. Whether they will move directly onto Western Gari or, you know, I don't know if, if Bifflesok will be burning. Certainly if everyone will be burning around us and we're the only ones that will not burn, then the potential will be far greater for a lot more game. Wow, this go bird is still going at it. I wonder if he sees something else. He's looking down sort of towards the ground or the tree. What do you see, my friend? What do you see? We certainly hope that the game comes through. I know of late it has been relatively quiet with the odd sighting now and again. I would love for all the game to come through. Wow. Then the, 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 there, is, there will be a positive to that and a negative to that though. The positive is that, yes, we'll get massive amounts of game. The negative, once, and it will only take a, f a couple of weeks, for new green growth to come out and that's all it takes and all the animals will flourish in those burnt areas it's amazing how quickly that greenery comes out of that blackened grass and uh, that green grass is amazingly nutritious and uh, you'll get massive amounts of zebra, wildebeest, impala, buffalo, rhino moving into these burnt areas and feeding on this uh, this gr new green flourish and, uh, <laughs> and then possible all the all the animals then move out of our area and then in, into the burnt area so we shall see what happens maybe nothing maybe nothing maybe the fire doesn't even get close enough you know if uh, if torchwood doesn't burn then you've still got that whole buff what we call a buffer zone between us and Kruger the whole of Bifflesuk, the whole of Chitwa Chitwa, Little Gauri in the south. So there's a lot of potential for game to move elsewhere. <laughs> Everyone's looking for giraffe today, this afternoon. It's interesting. Haven't been too much giraffe around. Okay.
<laughs> Hello Linda. Linda's asking a question that I love to answer. And that is, if I could come back as any animal, what would it be? I'd come back as a six ton elephant bull, Linda. Of course I'd have to get there first. <laughs> but um, you can imagine if you're a six ton animal, you're the largest land mammal. Who on earth, or what on earth, besides of course us humans, is going to is going to really do anything and, and threaten you? I want to be able to walk around anywhere I want, any time of the day, eat 21 hours out of 24, not, not having to worry about putting on weight, because the more weight you put on, the better that is. So uh, certainly coming back as a six-ton elephant bull would be my best option. So, you know, everything sort of makes way for you. You can swim, you can go to a water source, and even the hippos make way for you. So that's my answer. Linda, what would you come back as? That's the question. What would you come back as? Kath, what would you come back as? Hmm. Never really given much thought to it. No, neither. Just came to me. I've, I've always liked elephants. I thought, well, and then just realized the, the answer. Sass Breland in the chat room saying, what about having to fight with other elephant bulls? Well, Sass Breland, as humans we fight with each other. No, we don't like to. But as an elephant bull, you're not, you're not territorial. The only time you are going to fight is, is when, you, when you want to mate. It's not always the case. Fighting is, is, is not a definite. So, uh, the odd occasion. Oh, wow. Phew, you got something. Phew. You got it. And um, the odd fight. So you get a chance to throw your weight around. That's okay. That's okay. Hope I don't ever break my tusks. Otherwise I'm really stuck then. I can't do any ring barking or I can't dig for anything. Can't win a fight with any with no tusks. So if I had to come back as an elephant bull, I'd just be a wise elephant bull. And if I did come across uh, another elephant bull that's following up on some females, I, there's so many elephants around. I'd just go and find some more. I know I say that with my human mind and human thought. And uh, you can imagine an elephant bull that's in must with 50 times the normal amount of testosterone flowing through his body. He's not really going to stop and go, well, I'm going to let this elephant bull go and mate. I'll go find the next female in Estrus. He's going to want to fight. And uh, when elephant bulls fight, they fight with everything that they have. To the extent that they break their tusks. <laughs> Alright, nothing much happening. Hippos are... Pretty much inactive. Go, bird still going. Goy, goy. He's moved from the. Oh, he's still in the same tree. I'm actually. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to climb out the vehicle quickly. And I'm just going to walk to the base of that tree, and I'm just going to see if it's there's possibly a snake or something there. See if we can see something. So if you give me a minute or two. What? 
How sweet. He's just looking up for him. He's just a fledgling. He's sitting again. <gasps> <laughs> Okay, so I looked and there's a baby go away bird sitting on a branch with very little feathers on him. So I'm going to pull up very just uh, quietly next to him and he's just sitting in the tree quite out in the open, which is quite unusual. And uh, I don't know if, if he's going to be able to fly, so I don't want to put any pressure on him. So I'm not going to get too close. We'll use the camera's zoom. Get to see him, but wow, that is that is a great find. A little fledgling. Where's he gone? Oh, there. See him. So I can see the the nest of the go away birds. Hello, hello, it's hello, in the hello, middle hello. of the buffalo thorn, just just to uh, about half a meter just behind this fledgling. And the fledgling sitting is obviously this is the time that he is uh, wanting to get out of the nest. Why? Sure, he's in a buffalo thorn, which is of course great protection for the nest when uh, chicks are small. Yeah, uh, he's he has the potential to get caught up in all these thorns. And this is going out live. Never seen this before. Never seen it. He's standing absolutely still, and this is obviously um, behavior that's instinctual. You get learnt behavior, and you get instinctual behavior. And this is instinctual behavior that's been ingrained that if there is any threat, this chicks know to be absolutely motionless, to not give away that, their position. And this chick is absolutely motionless at the moment. I only see one chick. Have you ever seen a baby go a bit? Yeah, I have. <clears throat> Sorry, I have. I used to feed them at the oh, rehab yes. centre all the time. Okay. They're very cute. They love their fruit. And they sit there and they gulp and eat their fruit. They're very sweet. Well, there we go. That's my first one in the wild. All right. Hippo's vocalising. <clears throat> Obviously because they're quite a common bird in the city as well, they used to fall out of their nests quite often. <clears throat> and people used to bring them to the rehabilitation centre for us to bring up. Yeah. <clears throat> huh. Well this for me is my highlight for the day. And he hasn't moved, eh? Fantastic. Let's leave him be. I don't want to stress him out too much. Also, I'm gonna come that side. I'm definitely looking for plummet. Which pump are we on? Uh, no, I'm not. Okay. Sure. Alright, let's leave this little youngster. Great, great stuff. Once again, just listening to surroundings and these go birds were very incessant. And just uh, following up on that, I thought it was a snake or something like that. Obviously with the chick being out. Which is quite weird because they're drawing attention to themselves. Very strange. But anyway, let's head out. Okay.
San Jose. Okay, let me just get down the hill here. from uh, Richard from uh, San, uh, San Jose asking about wildfires where he is wildfires are left to burn because of a build up of a lot of dead material and Is that better? Alright, I'm gonna move away. It's fine. Apparently not getting great signal down by the water's edge. But uh, to answer your question, Richard, do we let wildfires go or do we fight them aggressively and put them out? Well, Richard, um, predominantly most of the land that, you know, we don't really get natural wildfires anymore because all the land that is, you know, has the, the bush that, that has a potential to burn is either owned or governed or you know it is managed in some form and if it is managed generally fires are, are put in place or fire breaks are put in place um, to avoid that simple fact that if a, if a wildfire does occur you know, it can happen at night when you're sleeping and then by the time you you know about it it's already on your doorstep so what what in South Africa what happens is that if you have a piece of land or you know if a bit of uh, a reserve or what have you a nature reserve and the policy in that area is to burn then they'll burn fire breaks or they'll burn the reserve and they'll let it go um, obviously keeping an eye on it if by some chance and it does happen that it does jump into an area and it does become a wildfire um, and of course it's it's an area that was not planned to be burned then it will be fought very aggressively I've spent many days fighting fires that was not supposed to happen from a from a planned burn that jumped so uh, if it's planned and it's an area that 
we want to burn then, uh, then we let it go the new sort of burning method is called mosaic burning where it tries to simulate the best natural fire conditions as possible where you light an area and you let it go you don't try and force it and burn every inch of it like what uh, a lot of uh, places used to do they used to burn and make sure everything burnt now they let it go they light it and if it burns half of it it burns half of it it's natural it's as close to natural as possible but uh, if but if it certainly doesn't uh, if it's not planned we'll try and stop that burn immediately and uh, I remember a reserve that I, I worked in fire was coming over the mountain now to stop a fire on a mountain is virtually impossible and so uh, the, the land owner didn't want the fire to get to the bottom of the mountain and spread through the whole of the reserve and burn pretty much it would have burned pretty much the whole of the reserve and then all his livestock rhino and all these species because uh, you know it's a fenced in area so you wouldn't have been able to feed them or you know they would have died so uh, he had to make a decision and uh, immediately hired literally within the time it took for the the fire to hit on the other side of the mountain for the fire to get up the mountain and down the other side it took about two days and in that time he got in two or three massive bulldozers and he literally told well the guys that drove these bulldozers and he literally they cut from either side of the mountain the whole the width of the head of the fire and they basically bulldozed this humongous fire break to each other and wide it was probably about 40 meters wide so as the fire came down over the mountain hit this bulldozed gravel sort of almost like an airstrip and it died out and he saved his reserve it cost him a lot of money to hire those bulldozers but he saved all of that money in transporting those animals out and feeding them and saving them possible death of the so yeah there are certain things that we just to let you know folks that uh, Alright, so uh, to let you know everyone that we are live at the moment, coming to you live from Juma Game Reserve, South Africa. My name is Jared, I've been presenting and guiding the afternoon's drive. We have Catherine on camera and Herman in final control. If you have any questions for us, please email them through to safari.me and I will try my best to answer those questions looking for anything that moves anything that doesn't move calls our attention we're on Buffalo so cut down our northernmost boundary so on our left hand side is Western Gowrie and on our sorry, on our southern side we have Western Gowrie and on our northern side we have Buffalo so we're gonna Gonna head down the hill and uh, head towards Gar Dam, and then uh, oh, possibly have a look around quarantine, see if anything. I know there were some zebra around. I don't know where the wildebeest have gone.
Hello everybody, this is Hadwan in Final Control and uh, we're just on, uh, the guys are just on Gauri Katlan at the moment we are getting a bit of signal break up there but we'll be sure to cut back to the vehicle as soon as possible so please be patient with us we'll be cutting live to our broadcasting vehicle in the next minute or so Okie dokie, you're back with us on the new Jigger. We still have to get a new name for this, or for a name for the vehicle. At the moment we're calling it new Jigger around camp. We call it the 110 because it's a 110, 110 inch, compared to the old Jigger which is a 90 inch. So, um, yeah, we're still going to figure that out. But, uh, must have, I must tell you, just driving now with uh, at this uh, cloud that's just moved in front of the sun, temperatures really started dropping and what I believe and think is going to be a chilly night very chilly night we're on Gary Cutline heading south towards Central Road we'll be on Central Road shortly we'll go over Gary Dam go and have a look around there go and do some spotting oh spot some buffalo 
Okay, let's go dark. There's uh, a couple of buffalo bulls in the drainage line here. Just going to head down to the drainage line, just where this large jackalberry is. The buffalo are where, a couple of months ago, the uh, two Kahuma females had killed a kudu. Couple buffalo boys or dugger boys. I hope we don't break up too much here. Should be okay. No buffalo, don't go away. There's a, a group of bronze mannequins, small little brown birds. As we watch these cantankerous large buffalo bulls. There's a bachelor group, no females here. This one at the back is the, the youngest of them all, smallest in body size. Excuse me. This is a perfect habitat for these buffaloes. I think these are the four buffalo that generally come down to Gauri Dam. And uh, spending their time down here in the thickets, the uh, common spikethorn thickets, where they like to rest up during the day, during the heat of the day, and ruminate. And that's uh, where they like to sit and hide and surprise you when you're on foot. Walk past a bush and suddenly this large head with very sharp horns protrudes from the bush. Nice to see some animals, some big ones. Located uh, for Madodonyati on the Mluwati, just on uh, the junction with uh, Central and Gari Cutline. They're slowly mobile north in the drainage line. The fork-tailed drongo using the opportunity to catch some insects. Even the flies that tend to buzz around the buffalo's head. But you can imagine an animal of that size is when that animal moves through this tall grass, all the insects are disturbed. And the fork-tailed drongo is quick to dive down and catch the, these insects. Very similar to that of the cattle egret. In areas that do not have the fork-tailed drongo, with the cattle egret will walk behind, being a much larger bird than the fork-tailed drongo, so they're not as agile in flight and won't be able to catch insects in flight. So what they'll do is they walk immediately behind the hooves of these large beasts, and as the insects fly up, they literally catch them out of the air like that. Let's see if we can follow them for a little bit. Remember this area very well, following those two lionesses a couple months ago. Gotta go around this tree stump here. Buffalo, you must certainly not be sort of take it for granted that it looks just like a cow because they have some of the meanest, aggressive streaks amongst all of the large mammals here 
in the African bush. A couple of these boys have a, big, a bit of a spa, nothing too much. A bit of a headbutting. Of course, this youngster certainly is outweighed by the large one. Look at those horns on this large buffalo. Wow. Certainly see he's been rubbing them a bit. See what he's doing now. This positioning of rubbing the chin on the back is this dominant sort of uh, stance. Quite often you'll see a dominant male mounting another male buffalo. and It's not homosexuality within the animal kingdom. It's another form of dominance. Let's try and go a bit more forward again. Where are you boys going? They're probably going to follow this drainage line all the way until it comes to Biffles or Cut Line. Which you're not going to be able to follow all the way because it's uh, getting much, much more thicker. Um, these are species that have to drink every day. So they've obviously had their... They came down this morning. I think there were a few buffalo down at Gary Dam this morning. Well, it's getting thick now. I don't know if I'm going to be able to get through, but let's have a look. Well, as far as we'll go. Let, let. <laughs> Chasing each other around the bush. That's okay, not with me. I can go around the bush. So they've had their drink. It's not too hot. They don't really have to wallow as much as what they do in, in summer. And they don't have to drink, although the intake is slightly less than they are they're now sparring. There we go. I'm not going to be able to follow up that bank. That bank's a little bit too steep for us. Ooh, I can hear those horns clashing. Hardened keratin layer over a very hard, thick, bony underlie. Can you see? Um, yeah. Serious. The only time that they'll seriously be fighting is. Uh, let me try and get underneath here. Might, might have a a really nice view of them just above us. Any time that they'll seriously be fighting and clashing those horns when there's females involved and the mating rights. No, don't go away. That's what I wanted. <laughs> that look. You see, what, what I've done now is I've put them above us, which immediately puts them in a more of a dominant position over us. So they should calm down. But of course, we're perfectly safe here. They're just above us now, which is such a nice position. Maybe make them relax a little bit more. Looks like they have. Oh, nice. They're not moving away now that they're above us. They don't feel as threatened and they can go about their duties now. Very nice. Okay, buffalo, got another one here just on the side. Where are they going to go? Hello there, boy. This one is rubbing himself on this poor little branch. It doesn't look like there's going to be too much of the branch left afterwards.
they'll use the foliage and branches to scratch in areas that they cannot. There is a horn boring moth that does irritate them a bit and I'll end up having to scratch those horns trying to eradicate. Also often what might deter the flies quite often is the uh, What is that? Yeah. Yeah, something very large in the grass. I don't know if it's another buffalo or what. I, I sort of assumed it was one because they weren't paying any attention. Yeah. yeah. There's something very large moving around in the bush here. I don't know what it is. I'm very low here. Oh, his eye's gone. Look at this. One buffalo's eye is completely... Oh, no, it's not. <laughs> I'm seeing things. It was just in the shadow. That is a buffalo. Here's the buffalo coming here. <laughs> Looked like his eye was gone because he had his face turned to the side. Hello there, Mr. Buffalo. Look at you. He is big. You snuck up behind us. That's very cool. Surrounded by Cape Buffalo. Three up the bank here. Very chilled at the moment. And one, this the largest one has now moved around. Looks like he's gonna move that way. See where he's gonna go. Hi there, John. Got a question from John asking: Is this the same buffalo that uh, was down at the dam last week? I don't know. I wasn't here last week, John, but I would presume these these four buffalo bulls are going to be in the area for a while. And those two spots that are just on the eye, you'll have a look. Uh, quite often, from rubbing, the fur often gets rubbed off. But the white spots that I know of um, there's a bit of speculation that you'll see lots of little white spots all over the face um, and I've yet to clarify but from what I know these white spots are just sort of bald patches from rubbing um, so this is this is nothing too serious he's looking straight at us that's great this is just where the hair has been rubbed off for some particular reason and um, but the white spots that I'm thinking of, they're faint, faint white spots all over. And uh, possibly this might be signs of uh, tuberculosis, BTB, bovine tuberculosis. Obviously, buffaloes carry the disease. And um, usually you do not see that they are affected too much. But of course, if, that, if the body of that particular buffalo is not dealing with it too well, it's not in great condition, then the, the, these signs might show. So... From what I know, the lots of little faint white spots all over um, are signs of tuberculosis, but these two that are just under the eye, they are too uniform to be able to be just random spots of TB. So these just look like they are balding spots that have been rubbed of the hair, possibly during the summer with flies, what have you, rubbing his face in bushes and what have you. Uh, same thing happens with impala during the rutting season. Their whole face, their, sort of that arch on their face, the bridge of their face, uh, gets completely void of hair because when they rub their horns on bushes and that subcutaneous gland um, between the horns, often all that fur gets rubbed off and they have this black face look to them. So it could very well be that, 
I'm not sure that buffalo have glands um, ne near the eye. I'm not too sure why they would need them. But um, I know that th this, this buffalo, is certainly this is just uh, two slightly bald patches of hair. This guy's working in circles. Where'd that other one go? It's gone up that way. Yeah, it's just on the left side. Okay. Right, let me reverse a little bit. Alright, let's head towards the dam for the final bits of daylight for the day. Very nice buffalo sighting. Buffalo is above us. Very, very cool. We come this way, or did we go around? Buffalo, thanks for being there for us. Second largest mammal we've seen this afternoon. Largest one being the hippopotamus. Those beautiful Tamburtis. I know Mark was showing viewers, all of you folks, this morning. These beautiful Tamburti trees. You really see that whole tree now. And Tamburti is occurring along the river lines, or what you call drainage lines. All the Tamburti is getting this green leaf now. Toxic plant, not fed on by many or most antelope or species. Only animal that I know of that feeds on Tamburti when it's in a small shrub form is the, is the black rhino. And uh, scientists still researching as to well, what it is that a black rhino has that is able to tolerate the toxins from the Tamburti. But certainly as humans we try and avoid that milky latex and also if you uh, are out in the bush and you need to make a fire be very careful to which pieces of wood you pick up if you are allowed to pick up any wood. Most reserves these days sell firewood. But if you pick up a piece of tamburti, even though it may be dry and dead, still has toxins in it. And if you put it in your fire and you inhale that smoke or you cook your food on that fire, you're in for some serious pain and sickness. Vomiting, diarrhea, headaches really really bad it's a beautiful tree very very beautiful tree i need to put a jacket on it's getting quite chilly now all right let's go up towards Gurry Dam.
than you actually still on the drainage line. Probably about 150-200 meters north of that large jackalberry on uh, Gary Cut Line, still on the drainage line. Nyala females. You only see two, okay? Uh, the one at the back is a, is a young male. Right, okay, I can't see from here. Well, there we go, a young Nyala male with a female. The male, of course, looks very similar to the colour. That's hence why I immediately thought it was a female. But you can just slightly see that white ridge of hair growing more so on the on the male eventually when he's fully grown his coat turns gray that whitened ridge becomes very prominent and they use that that ridge of hair when performing pilo erection when uh, two males will go into combat as they say and they will strut in a circle completely erasing that hair making themselves look larger trying to intimidate one another before they start rutting and fight for mating rights over females you can just start seeing that grey slight tinge to the fur along the neck and the head. Eventually the only light brown you'll see is, is almost look like socks on all four legs. They'll have these very light and brown uh, sort of uh, leggings. Quite an aggressive uh, antelope species down in Natal in, in southern Africa. The, this particular species of antelope is quite prolific and tends to bully a lot of other antelope species from a food source. But out here in uh, Mpumalanga, well, our province in the Greater Kruger, Nyala are not too prolific. Mpala are the most prolific and uh, they're outnumbered so that generally you won't see too much bullying being done. They are outdone by the numbers. Ready. Oh, look at that setting sun. Let me see if I can get it quickly before it goes. Get out to Central Road here quickly. Don't go down yet. Don't go down. Ah. Setting sun. There we go. That's what I'm looking for. All the lightning rods in the, from the lodge, though. But anyway, look at that. From this morning sunrise amongst the mist, all the smoke and the cloud, to a setting sun amongst the smoke of the fires occurring in here in the bushveld. Bit of low cloud. We're going to see the sun completely disappear above that tree line. Remember folks, we are coming to you live from Sabi Sand, South Africa. This is Juma Game Reserve and this is Safari TV. My name is Jared. I've been presenting and guiding the afternoon's drive with Catherine on camera and Herman in final control. If you
you have any questions for us, please email them through to finalcontrol at safari.tv and we'll answer them to the best of our knowledge as you watch this beautiful orange set its head down on another day in Africa. Right, there we go. Another day gone. Another day. Okay. Hello Nathan. Thanks for the welcome back. Appreciate it. Good to hear from you. Nathan asks, how long do Nyala live for? Well, their general life expectancy, you're probably looking at uh, the vicinity of about 15 to 20 years, give or take. 15 to 20 years. Okay, look at the size of the animal as to how long they live with mammals. 
The only exceptions are the reptiles, where things like as small as a tortoise can outlive pretty much everything else. So uh, generally in mammals, this <coughs> generally you can look at the smaller the animal, the shorter the lifespan. So Nyala probably looking at about 15 to 20 years. Nathan, hope you're doing well. And we're coming across Gary Dam. Looks like the zebra have come this way and they've moved up. Looks like the zebra have moved out of the area. Nothing, nothing at Gauri. Just stop and have a look around a bit. Ah, let's have a look. Nothing too much, eh? No mammal life around. No, no sign of life. Some guinea fowl coming down. Possibly going to make their way down for a roost. I saw them last night come and roost in the leadwood that's just to the right of uh, the camera. So, uh, yeah. The resident flock of guinea fowl. What's that? Alrighty. Lucky we got to see those buffalo. We're very lucky. Resident herd of Impala have moved just south of the dam. Gonna head up towards quarantine, try Zoe's Road. That way. is certainly dropping nicely now. We'll be down to about, oh, I'd say a good 18 degrees. Sydney is going to get a little bit colder still. Yeah, the guinea fowl are now making their way into the tree. See if you can get that, yeah? See if they're flying into one of the acacias. Slowly making their way up. One by one. Come on, jump. There we go. One, next one. They'll be sitting on the outskirts of that tree. They've learned their lesson with Mishu and Induna around. Those two boys love to climb the trees and chase guinea fowl. And uh, the two boys not being as big as what they are going to be, they can still climb those thinner branches. So these guinea fowls are having to roost on the thin most branches that are right on the outside 
of that tree. But that certainly doesn't stop the boys from trying though. I've seen them on a few occasions trying. Here they go, another one up. All pretty much lining up. Let's see. There we go, one more. And it looks like there are two. And another one, and the last one. One more. As soon as this last one goes, we'll go. Come on. <laughs> no, he's, he's still thinking about it. <laughs> ah, and there he went, I saw him go. Alrighty. Here we go. Nice. The whole flock of guinea fowl in the tree for the nuts. We'll be needing to use the spotlights in the next, I'd say, 15 minutes or so. Ah, the baboons are out. Let's go sit some and watch some comical baboon behaviour. The baboons will be this will be their last bit of movement for the day. We actually saw them here this morning, and they've been spending the whole day busy foraging. Looks like they're going to be making their way to Yuri's house where they pretty much roost in the fever trees and the marula tree there. Few of them still looking out, sitting on raised positions, acting as sentinels, not really having to worry about too many aerial predators now. Far too cool for that, for aerial predators. Now they're going to be making sure they're looking for terrestrial predators leopard, lion, snake. Only the largest of snakes, the African rock python, that is able to take a baboon. They'll certainly be using as much of this daylight as possible to fill their tummies before the night, for the, before the day's out. Quite interesting to see how separated and the big distance between a troop like this. I've just seen one climb a marula at the house and the furthest one sitting way way back almost at the junction with Philemon's cut line I know with Darth Vader and Tank Man I know Darth Vader sort of generally segregates himself he would like to join I'm sure and he sits separated and sometimes calls sort of just stays within visual or audio distance and there's a, a dominant male sitting underneath the tree here. This could be Tank Man. And the one at the back could be Darth Vader. Tank Man just keeping an eye on Darth Vader saying, I can still see you, my friend. 
making sure you don't come too close. I love sitting here in quarantine. It's so peaceful. Hello, Pamela. Very good question. Pamela is just asking, with uh, a lot of the game that's moved out of the area, could it be with all this lion roaring that's been going on, because it was quite intimidating? Certainly the effect has been noticed with all the commotion of the lions. Uh, certainly that, or, you know, I, d I don't think, um, I mean, the whole of Western Gauri is, is relatively quiet, so that's i don't think that's the from the effect of the lions uh, it's been relatively sort of quiet for for a while now um but certainly within the immediate area i'd say within at least five or so kilometers around where all this lion behavior has been happening certainly animal life has changed somewhat um i, I would say most most animal life certainly does know about the lion roaring and what have you and certainly it's the the animals that don't really have to worry about the lions elephant rhino things like that aren't really affected but certainly antelope that are will be predated upon by these uh, lion will certainly know about it but up here pamela this is uh this is certainly not the effect of the lions This generally, this this is what happens sometimes. Sometimes you go through quiet patches and then you have prolific days. When one morning you can have an amazing morning, and the afternoon you can have a quiet quiet afternoon. So it just is uh, just is dependent on animal movements, where they are generally where there is a food source. We'll just have to wait our turn for a lot of those animals to come our way. Oh, there's a, one of the big boys coming at the back there now. Oh, he's the one with the injured leg we saw this morning. So it seems the one at the back was this particular large male. Plus we're just segregating himself. He's not able to keep up as much with the troop with an injured leg. With all that movement during the day. So he obviously just sits in his little shady spot. And he does his sort of immediate foraging within the area. Keeps an eye on the rest of the troop. Obviously he keeps an ear to the ground as well for any predators. And now that it's getting a bit dark... They're all moving towards Yuri's house where they'll all start re roosting and perching for the doubt. It's almost as if someone's rung the bell and said, Right, everyone home. He's the last straggler. Still keeps up a relatively good pace. See, so he keeps off that back right leg when he runs like that. Possibly in a fight, maybe this is Tank Man, and he, this is uh, remnants of a fight with Darth Vader. I certainly can't tell the differences between all the dominant male baboons. I suppose any Graham would be able to see the physical differences.
he's having to rest. So we'll uh, make our way around and we'll carry on with the drive. He obviously needs to rest that leg a little bit. It'll be a little bit painful for him to walk on it. But you best not be too long. There will be predators about, I'm sure. We need to find them. Yep, they're all starting to climb all over the house and the trees. A few of them just on the ground here. <laughs> Look at them up here. No, this is not uh, bush or what have you, just to show you where they're going to be roosting. We use this water tank to cross in. And there's some already in the tree. There we go. And the marula tree here. Oh, a mother with her baby on the roof. can still smell a bit of the potato bush around. Yanks are still getting a little bit of play before the day's out when they can see. Of course at night the eyesight is pretty much like ours with night vision. The eyes have got cones where the nocturnal predators have got rods. Heavily rodded eyes have got no color vision but have got very good night vision. Not very good depth perception either with the heavily rodded eyes. The color vision and cones very good depth perception. Perception. To the updates, the only thing that's been uh, found this afternoon from all the other guys, and it was found about five minutes ago, was a crash of two rhino five cheetah cut line. How about that? <laughs> cheetah cut line. That's the only other thing. Wow. Everyone's having a bit of a tough day. We'll carry on. We've probably got about, about 30 minutes, 35 minutes left of drive. Remember, we are coming to you live. Please send in us, please send us your questions at Final Control at Safari.tv. And uh, yeah, we see what else is going to be out and about. You never know. You never know. Have to stay positive at all times. Oh, 
Right, we're on Zoe's. We just turned off Voyager Tele Access. Gonna go all the way down Zoe's. Try to come up Philemon's cut line. Let me see if we can find some hyena. Any hyena around? Here the pearl spotted owlets calling. Of course, pearl spotted owlets are known to be more crepuscular than nocturnal. Crepuscular meaning to be more active during dusk and dawn. It's not to say that they're not going to be active at night or during the day. But of course, when you refer to an animal's peak activity, that's when you label them either diurnal, nocturnal or crepuscular. Looking up in the trees, looking for eye shine, maybe a tail hanging down from a lazy leopard. A genet. I haven't seen a civet in a while. Raccoon like looking animal. Wouldn't mind seeing a, a civet. They generally also more out and about in summer when their predominant food source is uh, more out, which is the millipede. Temperature now quite chilly. Catherine is already on her one millionth, one hundred and ninety-five thousandth layer. She looks like the Michelin man. They call you the Michelin woman. You know what I want to do. Can you show the viewers what you look like, yeah? Yes? That's great. And it's a close-up. <laughs> and I'll show you my earmuffs for later. <laughs> There we go. So it's a bit of a close one, but uh, <laughs> Thanks, as far as the lead can go on the camera, just to show you a cast looking quite well snug and warm. <laughs> Certainly this is just the beginning. As the song goes, we've only just begun. Who sang that song? No. Is there anyone out there? Is there anyone watching? Oh, it's been quiet. Past a couple of drives have been relatively quiet. We are. We come out every day. Whether we see a hundred things or whether we see none. Go ahead. Hello Ellen, Extra from Illinois. Ellen is asking, uh, are there any birds that fly at night, large birds of prey? Well, uh, Ellen, we have no the only birds of prey that we have a fly at night are the owls, raptors, or known as raptors. We have a few other species. The most uh, common of the other nocturnal species is called the, uh, the nightjar. It's a bit of an unusual name for a bird, nightjar. A bird that has the most amazing calls. Often see them sitting in the road like to uh, sit in the road so they can see their prey which is insects and you get uh, 
get a few bronze wing courses a Corsa so uh, certainly not only the Raptors out and then we must not forget the other things flying around which we get a lot out here are the bats get a lot of bats Ellen but yes owls the night jars the courses those are I'd say the more prominent of the nocturnal flying animals and if we see a night jar I'll certainly stop and we can have a look at it see an owl that'll be great uh, there's uh, been a verose or a giant eagle owl that's been spotted around quarantine a few times happy to see if he was around but uh, no sign of him of course we would know that he was around because the other birds would be mobbing him because they don't like him around but I heard a pearl spotted owlet about three minutes ago very distinctive call that ascending that gets to a climax and a descending. And I'll try my best at doing it. And it goes something like this. There we go. That's my pearl spotted outlet call. Quite a few owls in our region. We've got the Scops owl, the barred owlet, the pearl spotted owlet, the barn owl. I'm sure we would get the maybe not the wood owl, maybe the grass owl, giant eagle owl, and spotted eagle owl. Quite a few. I remember quite a few years ago I had some birders and on the way home one night we started seeing a few owls and we said well let's see how many owls we can see and I'm not kidding we saw 13 owls and four different species. How amazing is that? So the giant eagle owl, the spotted eagle owl, the barn owl, and the pearl spotted owlet. Those are the four species and I think we saw something like seven different spotted eagle owls. Okay. <coughs> ah, thank you. Thanks Julia. Julia giving me the answer to the song we've only just begun by the carpenters. If only I could sing as well as that. I will not give you my rendition with a bit of a snotty nose and a bit of a clogged throat. <laughs> Who's that from? Hello Peggy. Peggy is just inquiring as to what sort of relationship are Kath and I? Or what do Kath and I have? Well Peggy, Kath and I have been boyfriend and girlfriend for about just under two and a half years. So yes we are a couple. And yes we should know each other well. I think we do. I think so. I think uh, on our way here, we were testing each other as to our favorite things. Favorite color, favorite food, favorite this, favorite that. And I figured out one thing, and that was, I'm very easy to remember things for because I have one favorite of each. Where Kath on the other hand has got many favorites of each. So for me, it's a little bit more difficult to remember all of these things. 
as the man in the relationship. Of course, you have to remember these things because it gets frowned upon and you get a whack on the side of the head if you don't remember certain things. So, uh, I got to brush up on my knowledge of some of the favorites coming down. So yes, Kath and I have been together for just under two and a half years. This month, in fact, the 25th of this month will be our exact two and a half year mark. <laughs> come on, owls, come on out. Thanks, just a reminder, we are coming to you live from Juma Game Reserve, South Africa. This is Safari TV. My name is Jared. I've been the presenter for the past two and a half hours with Catherine on camera and Herman in final control. If you have any more questions for us, please send them to at final control at safari.tv. I'd love to hear from you. I really would. It seems as though with these quiet times get to know some of you and who is out there in between the animal sightings. We'll be looking for any form of life with the spotlight, preferably the nocturnal species. So we're trying not to, sh well we will, will not be shining on diurnal species that their eyes can be harmed by the spotlight. Things like antelope, Elephant, rhino, things like that. We're looking for leopard, the cats generally, are the smaller creatures, genets, things like that. See a leopard now. Let's see a leopard now. Let's go up Zoe's Road in the southwesterly direction. We're going to be coming up to uh, Fulhamon's cut line. Well, what a good find this is, and quite interesting to see it this late in the season. It's a flap-necked necked chameleon, and uh, usually they're only really out in summer when it's still quite warm at night. The fact that we're in winter and we've spotted one, this is quite rare. He's not moving very much, and uh, he'll be out looking to feed. And generally an animal like this would, uh, during winter, find a thick bush and pretty much go into a torpor or a hibernation state and try and stay as inactive and conserve as much energy as possible to make their way through winter. So there we go, a chameleon. Not moving at all. How close are you on him, Rika? 
fairly good close up. It's not Kay. complete detail, but you can see him. Okay, cool. All right, just making sure that everyone can see him. That's fine. There we go. Another different find for the day. That's the second reptile for the afternoon. Second reptile. First one was that water monitor. Alrighty. We're probably going to break up a little bit here. Hello everybody, this is Hadman Final Control and uh, the guy's just going through a bit of a bad single patch at the moment. I just want to remind you about the fireside chat tonight. Myself, Hadman, will be around the fire and uh, we'll be talking about some of uh, the history of the last three years uh, here at uh, Safari TV and previously Wild Earth. So please join us for that at uh, 6.30 Central African time. Where we'll be sitting around a beautiful warm African fire the temperature is uh, um, getting a little bit cooler at the moment and uh, sitting next to the fire will be uh, very, very nice and it will be great if all of you can join us at 6.30 Central African time. Uh, that is half an hour after, after the game drive finishes and we've got about another 19 or 18 minutes left until the end of our PM safari, then a half an hour and then at 6.30 the fireside chat. We'll be cutting back to the game drive vehicle shortly. Alright, we're back. So I just had to quickly do that little section. 
and uh, Gary Main. And I'm now on Shibam Road. Shibam heading north, gets to the junction with Philemon's Cut Line and Treehouse Dam Road. Hoping that if Mafufunyan came in when we saw him yesterday morning, and uh, there's that impala heard if he was successful. And the guys went and let a look around. Trias Dam, nothing there. Maybe he's still in the area with a kill or something. No more bird life. It's still, it's, well, it is quite cold, so. Not much bird life out and about. Have seen a few bats. Only flying mammal, the bats, that we get. What we call true flight. You do get the flying foxes, but not real true flight. It's more of a, a glide than flight. The true flying mammal. About 15, 10 to 15 minutes left as we try and scramble in something. Last bit of drive left. What is out there? What is out there? So we need the elephants to come through this area. Firm razor. That razor asking do all our snakes hibernate in winter. Well, <coughs> razor certainly will. We're just asking about do all our snakes hibernate in winter. Well, razor, to answer your question, I saw a snake. Uh, two days ago coming in so certainly not every single snake will hibernate but certainly the majority will of course being a reptile and not able to thermoregulate and get, get heat then certainly he's not going to be able to survive to hunt its food so I'd say quite a big percentage prominent snakes are going to be hibernating hence why when a lot of uh, guests that I had while I was guiding a lot of guests used to ask me when is the best time to come on safari and I say well it depends on you if you don't like insects and reptiles winter is certainly the best time to come because there's not many around the fact that I saw one two days ago is probably one of the last remaining snakes around possibly moving around just to be able to get to his last spot to his burrow but certainly you will not see your percentage of seeing a snake in the middle of winter is very slim you'd have to be very lucky or in some people's cases very unlucky But there we go, we just saw a chameleon earlier, which is also for me one of the latest uh, sort of chameleons I've ever seen in winter. Okay. 
talking to Dave. Dave's just asking, why don't we have a tracker on the front of the vehicle? Well, Dave, um, it would be a bit difficult when getting into lion or any cat sighting when um, you have to have the tracker inside. Now, on the old Jigger, when there was no space, this was not possible. And, um, yeah, it's, it's generally, it's not really, it's not needed as much. I mean, a lot of, uh, well, all of us, I know, are pretty good trackers or presenters. Patrick is probably the best tracker out of all of us. He used to work as a tracker. Uh, it would help, but sitting up there in the front would certainly not help with uh, viewing with the camera. You wouldn't see as much. And a lot of the logistics behind getting sound onto the tracker and, uh, and all that sort of thing. So it's just, it works better not having a tracker just from a logistical point of view, but certainly it would help when looking for things. Absolutely. Uh, for most of my guiding career, I had a tracker and I can tell you 100% that it is better. But uh, when doing this with uh, television and internet and, and when you're dealing with all sorts of other things it certainly is not easy and it's not possible as much and it just means that we have to brush up on our tracking and we have to work a little bit harder but I enjoy tracking I enjoy it I learned from a uh, Shangan and uh, he was one of the best trackers at the lodge I worked at and uh, he taught me a few things in my time with him eventually we formed a very close bond uh, I always used to say to guests I just, and it was true I spent more time with my tracker than I did with any other person on planet earth <laughs> just to show you I mean, the drives that we used to take in the area where we were, our morning drives were up to sometimes five hours long. that story so yeah I've got to spend more time with him in a day it was easy to spend up to 10 hours a day with my tracker which was more than anyone else so you can imagine the bonds that you form we knew each other's movements we need we understood each other very very well and the, the guests used to benefit very much from this uh, what's that in the road I saw something in the road it just crossed ah it's in Pala <laughs> or is it? it's something small it's a Daker there's a pair of Daker I'm not going to shine on it it's an antelope its eyes have adjusted now to this light, if I suddenly shine on it, its eyes are going to be strained, not good for the animal. But it was a pair of Dacre, grey or common Dacre, they're known as. Alright, just coming to the end of Philemon's cut line, to the junction with uh, Quarantine last bit of the drive I've had a good time I've had a good time, no it hasn't been the most prolific game but uh, well, I had some good birding got to see those buffalo, good sighting of those buffalo I enjoyed those buffalo quite a bit Look at all the eyes, wow. 
all those Impala that were down by or just south of Gowrie Dam have just moved onto quarantine and as we came up oh another Daker wow as we just got up to the road they're just like a million eyes just looking at us quite nice to be able to oh hyena calling Calling in that block. Wow, that was a long call. That was awesome. They're in the block between where we think there's a den, between Philemon's cut line and Twin Dams Road, somewhere in the middle of that block. They're calling from there. We always see the hyenas darting into that area. Getting a few eyes and looks from these Impala. <laughs> what is this human doing sounding like a hyena? Loads and loads of eyes. Ooh, and a little scrub here. Okay. Hello Annika. Annika is asking a question that gets asked quite a lot actually. Annika is asking, uh, do I know of any incidents that have happened where guest staff or guests have ever been bitten by any snakes? Um, I've only known one guard that was bitten by a spitting cobra got into his room because he left his door open so he was silly and it uh, crawled up onto his bed and he turned over on it and bit him he survived he was fine uh, guests sure but I've never heard of I mean I'm sure it has happened but I've never come across any guests or well, I've never been in, in an area where a guest has been bitten by a snake I have been in an area where a guest got stung by a scorpion at a lodge many many years ago a scorpion had made its way onto this gentleman's bath towel and